But God bless you all. Enjoy the day. And I'm coming down to do that Easter egg roll in just a minute. Thank you all so very, very much. Thanks, everybody. And by the way, say hello to Oyster Bunnies. Come on up, Bunnies. Get up here so they can see you. This is my video update on this Tuesday afternoon, April the 2nd. Let's talk about some news. So yesterday in the Middle East was a very disturbing, troubling day, a gruesome day in, uh, in the Middle East. And let me start things off with these two posts on X, which sum up the terrible events that took place the last day in the Middle East. And the first post comes from Mohammed Al-Safin. This morning began with the revelation of Israel's gruesome Shifa hospital massacre. A few hours later, Israel bombed the diplomatic compound and embassy in Syria. Tonight, it has murdered several foreign aid workers in an airstrike on their car in Gaza. And Edward Snowden replied to this tweet, and he said, the Netanyahu regime now pulling off the rare feat of violating both the Geneva Conventions and the Vienna Convention at the same time. You're living through history, folks. So the foreign aid workers killed by the IDF yesterday were preparing meals for Palestinians, and they worked with an organization called the WC Kitchen. They put out a post on Twitter X, World Central Kitchen. We are aware of reports that members of the World Central Kitchen team have been killed in an IDF attack while working to support our humanitarian food delivery efforts in Gaza. This is a tragedy. Humanitarian aid workers and civilians should never be a target, ever. And I believe that some of the, uh, the aid workers killed from WC Kitchen were from Australia and, uh, and the United Kingdom, as well as other, other countries that were serving food to uh, Palestinians when they were killed yesterday. Now, the strike on the Iranian embassy in Syria, the Iranian embassy in Syria was hit. Actually, to be more precise, it was a building, an annex next to the Iranian uh, embassy in Syria. I've read reports which claim that this was the consulate uh, building as well as the, the residency for uh, some embassy officials, but I'm not 100% sure on that, but this was part of the Iranian embassy compound or property that was hit yesterday in Syria. And uh, this, this missile strike on the Iranian embassy in Syria is beyond beyond words, beyond explanation. I don't care who, who was in the embassy at the time. It's, it's not relevant in my opinion. Uh, this is an embassy and uh, an embassy should never be targeted in, uh, in a missile, drone, bomb, in any type of attack. Uh, embassies are off limits or at least they, they were off limits. Uh, Israel and Netanyahu, they crossed, they crossed a, a, very, a very big um, red line, a very taboo, very big taboo red line. I actually read that on a, 
on a Twitter thread. I forgot who it was that said this was this was crossing hitting an embassy was crossing a taboo. You should never hit an embassy. Arno, Arnaud Bertrand. There is no overstating just how absolutely insane this is. There is no precedent. None of a state deliberately bombing an embassy. It didn't even happen during World War I, World War II, or even the 19th century. Heck, even during the medieval era and the Roman Empire, the protection of envoys and messengers, even from enemy states, was a recognized norm. The only other historical instance was NATO bombing the Chinese embassy in Belgrade in 1999, killing three Chinese journalists. But the U.S. profusely apologized. Bill Clinton publicly said it was a mistake, something China still doesn't believe to this day, compensated the families and paid to rebuild the embassy. All of this highlighting how profound a taboo this is in international relations. How profound a taboo this is in international relations. I think that's... That sums up the, the situation, the actions taken by Israel and Netanyahu perfectly. An attack on an embassy. On the Iranian embassy in Syria. Huh, anyway, so the, uh, the analysis, and I believe this is the correct analysis, is that uh, Netanyahu, and I would say by extension the neocons, uh, they want to to pull Iran into into this conflict because Iran is going to have to respond or retaliate. Though I believe Iran is not going to to retaliate right away or in a way that that many of us imagine um, a retaliation to to happen in this instance. Uh, I, I don't know how Iran is going to retaliate. Uh, they're going to have to retaliate. They're going to have to retaliate. Uh, they just they, they can't let, let this let this go unanswered but when and how and what it's going to be i don't know i have no idea but uh, definitely netanyahu and the neocons that prop up netanyahu and his entire administration they want to pull iran into into a conflict they want iran to retaliate and uh and then they want to pull the united states into this conflict not covertly, overtly. They want the U.S. involved in, uh, in this conflict, which will just lead to an all-out Middle East regional war, maybe even a World War III, who knows. But uh, that's, that's the analysis as to why this was done, and I think that is the, the correct analysis. Uh, big picture... You know, the neocons, they see that they're losing on all fronts. They're losing with Project Ukraine. Things are not going well in, uh, in Gaza. Things are not going well in the Middle East in general. Uh, they're losing ground in, in Africa. Uh, BRICS, the multipolar world. Uh, the neocons, they, they see that, that they're losing. That they're losing uh, very, very bad. And, and their only answer, their only answer to this is more war. That's always the neocons' answer to, to when things are not going their way. Whenever they suffer a defeat, their only answer is more war, bigger wars, more destructive wars. And so that's, that's what they're trying to do here. And always keep in mind that Biden is a neocon and his entire staff is uh, neocons and neolibs and there's really not much difference between the neoliberals and the neocons they're pretty much one and the same they they each want more war they each want more power they each want more control uh, but they justify it in different ways the neocons are probably more honest in their justification. They just want the, the power of it all, the domination, the power. The neoliberals, they hide it in, uh, they hide their lust for war and power uh, in, in values and, and stuff like that. Uh, 
the international order and and values and human rights, and then that's how they hide their their lust for uh, for power and their desire for war. Anyway, uh, yesterday the the Al Shifa hospital, the attack on on the Iranian embassy, the killing of of chefs, of people cooking food, the killing of people cooking food. It's, um, it's a defeat for, for Israel. And it's a defeat for, for the Biden White House and for the neocons. Everything that happened yesterday, in, in a strange way, highlights their defeat. Doesn't look, doesn't look that way. That's what it does. It exposes their, their weaknesses and their defeat, in my opinion. The, the global majority, the global South, is after everything that, that went down the other day, the, uh, the global South is, is going to be more united than, than ever before. So I will end it there. A terrible day yesterday. Terrible couple of, of weeks, a terrible, terrible March and a bad, a very bad beginning to April. So uh, this morning, uh, Ukraine makeshift uh, drone, I guess. Uh, it, it looked like a Cessna plane, but it was obviously a drone. It uh, tried to hit... Um, uh, uranium, uh, a geranium, uh, kamikaze, uh, drone factory in Tartastan, Russia, way, way far away from the front lines, like far, far away from the, from the conflict that is taking place in Ukraine. And this, this plane slash drone concoction crashed into some buildings from what I understand next to this drone factory or on the grounds of this drone factory but they didn't actually hit the factory they hit like residential buildings or office buildings and there were some some people that were injured though I don't think anyone was killed in this attack but uh but the video images are out there and you could see this this plane just traveling into into this area in Tartarstan and hitting hitting a building next to to this factory that makes the the kamikaze drones so a lot of people are wondering how did this plane make it from Ukraine all the way to to the Tartarstan region i don't know a lot of people are speculating that this, uh, this makeshift drone was launched from inside of, of Russia because everyone's having a hard time. I'm having a hard time trying to understand how this plane made it all the way to, to Tartarstan. Don't know, but uh, Ukraine, they also launched uh, missile and drone strikes yesterday into Belgorod, and I believe there were nine, nine casualties. Nine people were injured, but uh, I don't... I don't think there were any any deaths, but uh, yesterday they launched a total of 32 missiles and drones uh, into Belgorod as well. So uh, an uptick in uh, in attacks from the Ukraine military um, into Belgorod is now becoming uh, commonplace. But uh, launching this this drone thing into Tartastan, this was pretty unique. And uh, why? Why is, uh, why is this happening? Why are we seeing the Ukraine military trying to hit at, at this factory located so far away from the front lines? Obviously, they want to get to the kamikaze drones, but at the same time, they're hitting Belgorod. And uh, a, little, a little bit of an escalation in Ukrainian... Um, attacks into Russian territory. Why this uh, this escalation? I believe it is because Russia is advancing, specifically 
in the direction of Chasov Yar. And the reports are that the Russian military is now one kilometer away from Chasov Yar. There have been uh, videos and images of residents in Chasov Yar being told, uh, getting a note and being told to evacuate the, the small town of, uh, of Chasov Yar. It would be smart if the Ukraine military retreated from Chasov Yar. From what I understand, uh, they will not be able to, to hold off the Russian forces. The noise that you hear is the work on this apartment building, which they have been working on for, I don't know, three, four years, building this, this apartment. But they're finally, finally getting to the end of it. Anyway, so yeah, the Russian military continues to advance, and so you're you're always you're always going to see an uptick in these types of uh, of attacks from the Ukraine military whenever Russia is about to to enter a new town or village or capture uh, a new town or village, and and you are going to see uh, attacks like what you saw in Tatarstan. These types of of, of very very bold, I guess you could say, bold, provocative, outrageous, crazy uh, attacks deep into Russian territory. Every now and then, the Ukraine military, they try these attacks. They try to hit uh, something deep inside of Russia. And it usually comes at a time when, when the Ukraine military is about to suffer a very, very significant and very big uh, defeat. It serves as, as a distraction to their collapsing position on the front line, though um, the target was carefully picked out. If this was indeed the factory of the, of the kamikaze drones, it, it was carefully uh, picked out. Uh, probably not by, by Ukraine, probably by, uh, if I had to guess, by, uh, by NATO, but who knows, that's just a guess. Anyway, in Kharkov, we are also starting to get videos of uh, residents starting to flee from Kharkov, which is the, was or is, the second biggest city in Ukraine. And uh, we're starting to get videos showing hundreds, if not thousands, of cars trying to get out of the city. Uh, one of the reasons that residents are starting to flee from Kharkov is because there is no power, no lights, no electricity. And another reason why you're starting to see residents flee Kharkov is because of the, the inevitable, what I believe will be an inevitable uh, Russian advance into Kharkov in order to create a buffer zone, a buffer zone which will will uh, protect or will try to to protect the border towns and villages of uh, Belgorod and, and Kursk and other areas on the border, which are the targets of Ukraine missiles and drones. So I believe residents, they see the writing on the wall. They see that Russia is going to be, to be entering Kharkov. When? I don't know. When or if? I could be wrong. Maybe Russia doesn't advance to Kharkov. But um, if they do enter Kharkov, they will take that, uh, that city. They will build a buffer zone. In my opinion, they will build this, uh, they will create this, this buffer area. And, um, and at the end of the day, the, the people that are living in Kharkov, they have no power. And I don't think power will be coming on anytime soon. So uh, you're seeing a mass exodus from Kharkov. From what I understand, the, the Russians are the only ones that actually have, at this moment in time, are the only, the only side capable to, to actually fix the, the power stations, the power supply into Kharkov. The Collective West, the EU, for them to, to repair the damage done to, to Kharkov, to the uh, power facilities in Kharkov, it's going to take them something like 18 months. But Russia can actually go in and, and, and fix the, the power outages in Kharkov. I, I just read that somewhere. I don't know if it's true or not. But anyway, 
Uh, that is the situation in, uh, in Kharkov. And the World Bank, they put out a message, or actually they, they responded to an inquiry. They responded to an inquiry from TASS News about the economic situation in Ukraine. And the World Bank signaled that Ukraine is facing bankruptcy. The Ukrainian economy is on the verge of collapse. According to the World Bank, uh, Ukraine is already uh, effectively bankrupt. But according to the World Bank, if Ukraine does not uh, receive $60 billion from the United States, and if the collective West and all the countries that have given money to Ukraine, if they don't write off whatever loans they've given to Ukraine, then the Ukrainian economy, the economy will indeed collapse. If in 2025, Western creditors refuse to write off Kiev's debts, including the debts of private companies and banks, the country could face bankruptcy, according to the World Bank. Interesting, huh? To write off the the debts of even the private companies in Ukraine. I wonder who the oligarchs and collective West officials or collective West's, collective West's children who sit on the boards of these private banks are. I wonder who all these people are that could have their debts completely written off according to the World Bank. Anyway, March 31st actually uh, was supposed to be elections in Ukraine, huh? Elections were supposed to take place in Ukraine, but those elections were called off because, because Ukraine is a democracy. That's what, that's what the Biden White House has been telling us. That's what the European Union has been telling us. So elections were supposed to take place on March 31st, but they were, they were canceled because of the martial law that is in effect and the parliament has agreed to extend the martial law and the martial law says that no elections can take place while the country is under martial law. And so Alensky remains as, uh, as president of Ukraine. Without an election, Alensky remains the president of Ukraine. So let's uh, do some more stories and uh, then we'll get into our clown world. Repo uh, Reuters is reporting that Iran actually tipped off Russia uh, days before the terror attack in uh, Moscow on Crocus City Hall. And according to Reuters, the information from Iran came after an interrogation of ISIS or ISIS-K uh, collaborators after the following the Kerman uh, attack that took place in, in Iran. And according to Reuters, Iranian uh, officials, they had information from these, uh, these ISIS-K conspirators. And they passed this information over to Russia a few days before the terrorist attack in Moscow. This is coming from Reuters. So, uh, and, and Reuters is citing unnamed officials. So take this with a very big, massive grain of salt. Uh, Peskov, the Kremlin spokesman, when he was asked about these, uh, these claims from Reuters, he said, and I quote, I do not know anything about this. That was Peskov's response to this claim from Reuters. Ursula von der Pirate, she's in trouble. Ursula is in trouble under investigation for corruption during the jab procurement process from a couple of years ago. You remember the whole lockdown jab thingamajig? Well, Ursula is now under investigation. According to Politico, the EU's top prosecutors have taken over an ongoing corruption investigation into Ursula von der Leyen. And according to Politico, the probe relates to the purchase of nearly 2 billion doses. The prosecution claims that Ursula negotiated this multi-billion dollar deal 
via private text messages. This is according to Politico YouTube. This is not me. This is Politico's reporting. So, according to Politico, Ursula refused to disclose the content of these private text messages. And conveniently for Ursula, she can't find these text messages. <laughs> can't find them. <laughs> Don't know where they are. Someone erased these text messages. Maybe Russia, maybe Putin. Maybe Putin erased the text messages. But why would Putin want to help out Ursula? I don't know. Just always blame Russia. <laughs> when in doubt, blame Russia. Maybe, maybe Ursula bleach bit the text messages. Maybe she called up Hillary and Hillary told her, don't worry about it, Ursula. Just bleach, just bleach bit those messages. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You know, it's pretty amazing. The, uh, the globalist elite, they want all of our information. They want all of our private text messages. They want everything that, uh, that we do on the internet. They want it all and they want to investigate it and they want to go through it. And they, and they even want to go after us if, uh, if they find something in, uh, in our private communications or in our online activity. But when it comes to their text messages or their online communication, <laughs> don't know. It just disappears. <laughs> it's been erased. <laughs> oh, man. So that is the latest on Ursula. And I hope it's not too noisy as we prepare for our clown worlds. Karine uh, Jean-Pierre, she was asked during the White House briefing, let's go for a walk, because now it got very noisy. She was asked during the White House briefing about the, the 60 Minutes report on uh, Russia's supersonic uh, Havana syndrome blaster gun sonic ray thing that uh, that they used to to melt the the eardrums or the brain cells or cause migraines in 1,500 U.S. officials or military personnel or whatever. <laughs> anyway, I talked about this in my video yesterday. She was asked about this during a White House briefing, and she said that U.S. intelligence community did not draw conclusions about Russian involvement in cases of Havana syndrome. So the Biden White House, U.S. intel, they haven't drawn up any conclusions yet, according to Karine Jean-Pierre. I wonder why the Russians don't use this technology, this sonic Wi-Fi radiation laser gun deafening sound technology elsewhere. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I wonder why they only use this on 1,500, from what I understand, 1,500 um, officials in, uh, in Cuba. I don't know. I can't explain it. I can't explain how the mind of the Putin works, how the Putin operates. But uh, anyway, the 60 Minutes report from, uh, from the other day on this Havana syndrome, <laughs> they actually have, uh, have a video from the 60 Minutes segment where uh, they're disguising one of their sources because one of their sources has to remain anonymous. <laughs> and so they... Uh, they actually have in this segment, they're putting makeup and, and a wig and, and all this stuff on, on one of their sources because, you know, you got to keep that, that source that is going to, to rat out, <laughs> to rat out the Russian state. You got to keep that source anonymous. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> and that source is like uh, explaining what Havana syndrome feels like. It's just like this massive blast that knocks you off your feet <laughs> it's like this huge massive sound blast that knocks you like i think this the source said something like five feet forward or something like that uh, anyway um there's a poll out there was a poll done which uh claims that 53 percent of ukrainians 
say it's okay to evade mobilization. That's right, 53% say that it is absolutely acceptable to avoid being sent to the front lines in order to to uh, die for the benefit of the neocons and the Alensky regime. So that's, uh, that was an interesting poll. And there's a video that's out that is all over social media. And this is, from what I understand, this is a video, a Ukraine video that was created, which is a split screen and shows the life of, uh, of the Ukraine elite during the two-year conflict and then it shows the life on the other side of the screen of uh of the poor of the people that haven't been able to escape ukraine that have been sent to the front lines and it it shows how the elite are living in the best hotels partying it up uh, music alcohol girls and then it shows the the poor being being taken away out of their homes and sent to the front line to, uh, to die in this conflict. It's an interesting video that's making the rounds on social media. And finally, finally, we have a video, video interview of uh, Ben Hodges. Ben Hodges. And the description of this video, which is on YouTube, is Ben Hodges. The siege of Crimea has begun as Ukraine takes control over the Black Sea and coastline. And uh, this is a video not from two years ago, not from a year ago, but from the other day. 30th of March, 2024. According to Bed Hodges, the siege of uh, Crimea has begun. Everyone, the siege of Crimea. from Ben Hodges. I don't know. I don't know where he's getting his news, but <laughs> what can I say? What can I say? Anyway, that is the video. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Odyssey Bitchute, Rockfin, Telegram, Rumble, and Twitter X, and go to the Duran shot shop pick up some limited edition merch the link is in the description box down below take care